welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to finish up our 2006 GMC Sierra. There's a few things that we didn't finish the last time. We got to do some mechanical work, and then it's ready for the road. Let's get started. We're going to pick up where we left off last time, putting our interior back together, and put this B pillar trim in there. We get to use both of our installation tools. Put the one on the passenger side. Now you can put our sill plate in. It just clips into the metal bracket that also routes the wiring harness. You can put these in before the seats or after, it doesn't really matter. Put the rear sill plate in. Again with the sill plate installation tool. Now we can put in our awkward seats. I really don't like these seats. We'll start with the little one because it actually goes underneath the big one. So we'll get that into place, set it down there. And now we'll get the really big and awkward one in the door. It's constantly trying to unfold as I'm trying to get it through the door without scratching everything up. It's also trying to pinch my hands at the same time. So this one fits better when it's actually kind of folded down. We'll lock it into place. And we'll fold it up. Then we can see the brackets. We can line up all the studs, drop it down in there. And we can start fastening it down. We run the nuts in the back. Then we'll put our little cover on and try to forget we ever had to take these seats out. Fasten the fronts down. And we'll fold the two seats together and fold them up. Now we can put our center console in. Just sets down in there. The seats hold them in place. Mm, look at all that yummy stuff. I should probably clean that. Yeah, right. So now we'll put the seats in. Just line them up with the studs in the front and the pin in the back and drop them in. And we can plug our seat in, put the little safety in there, and we'll thread our bolts in. Tighten them down. And we'll put our little cover over our wires. Tighten up the nuts in the front. Click. And we'll put the bolt back in the support for the dash. Run that into the floor. And we'll put the little trim piece over it. Just snaps on there. And now we can put our driver's seat in. Set it down on our studs. I chose to do this with the sill plate off, just to change things up a little bit. We'll bolt our seat down. Plug it in. This seat had a cap that covered up the bolt on the inside, so we'll snap that back on. Then we'll put our little cap over our wiring harness, as if somehow it actually covered up the wires. Probably not important, 
but it was there when I got here, so I'll put it back. Now we'll tighten up the nuts on the front. We'll put the kick paddle trim in. And a couple tabs and that snaps in. And now we can put our soap plate in. Slide under the seats and clip it into that metal bracket. Make sure you don't have the wires pinched in there or you end up with an airbag light or a window that doesn't work or whatever else. And yes, I'm speaking from experience. So now our interior is back together. We can move on to the outside. We'll put our front bumper back together. So we'll clip in the clips on the outside. Hey look, the Gnome has a bumper installation tool. And then there's a bunch of little plastic clips that go across the metal bumper that hold that plastic piece in. We'll snap all those in. And now we'll start putting our bumper brackets in. We had to take these brackets out in order to get to the little plastic clips. They clip the plastic balance onto the bottom of the bumper. We'll run the bolts back in there. We'll tighten up this nut on the carriage bolt, which would not be possible if this truck was from the land of corruption and rust. Anyone up here knows the struggle of carriage bolts. Tighten the other bracket down, and we'll drop our fog lights in here. Also had to take these out to get to the little plastic clips. It'll make it easy to get to that balance. Put the fog light on this side. And we'll put our little lower grill in, balance support bracket, whatever you want to call it. It's just a piece of plastic. Got a couple little push rivets in there. Snap those in. I'll snap the little rubber strip on the bottom of our valance. I guess it's the even lower lower valance or the parking lot bumper locator. Use the bumper installation tool. A couple little hits, snap those clips in there. And I actually did put a couple screws in the end. We'll run those in there. And our bumper's assembled, ready to go back on the truck. So we'll slide it on the brackets. Try not to drop it. Run the bolt in the center just so it doesn't fall on the ground. Then we'll start the brackets on the side. Get those where we want it. Then we can run all the four bolts in the center down, tighten it up. And we can throw our grill back in. Line up all of our clips, snap it in. Put the one bolt in the center, and now we can put our lights in. Put our daytime running light in, our turn signal, and our marker light. The daytime running lights require two people to check, or a mirror, because if you set the parking brake, the lights don't come on. It only come on when it's in drive, and it's not dark out. So, the only way to do it is to have somebody sitting in there with the car in drive. I guess if you're really fast, you could check it yourself, but... Plug in our headlight, put the two pins in it, 
put it back in. That's pretty easy. Do the marker light on the other side. Plug all the bulbs into it. Clip it in. Same thing with the headlight. We'll check all of our lights and make sure it's ready for the safety test. Luckily, I have a light checking gnome to help me because I'm too old and slow to try to jump out of the truck, check them and jump back in before it runs me over. I'd end up like that guy in the video getting run over by his squatted truck. Although, I think he deserved that. And hold on to your seats because we have a check engine light on. Surprise, surprise. A no six Sierra with a check engine light. Not even sure why I need a scanner. You already know, it's gonna be an EVAP code. But just in case we're wrong, let's find out. Yep, we got a vent valve control circuit problem. Probably a bad vent valve, but we're still gonna test it. Because I don't like to just throw parts at cars. So to test it, we'll just actuate it with the scanner. See if we hear it click. If we don't hear it click, then we'll go check the wiring. No clicky. So now we're gonna make sure we're getting a signal to it. If we have a signal and no clicky, we have a bad solenoid. If we don't have a signal, we have a wiring problem. It's a pretty simple power and ground. It's commanded on right now, so the test light's on. So we are getting a signal, make sure it goes off. It's off, turn it back on. Turn it on and off a couple times so you can see that it's not a fluke. I'm satisfied. Our signal wires are good. We have power going to it and a ground. So we have a bad solenoid. So we're gonna change it. And somebody's been here before. So should be pretty easy. So we'll bend the little tab so we can slide the solenoid off of its bracket. Then we'll pull the hose off the vapor canister. It's full of sand and everything else. It's from Texas, probably full of barbecue sauce too. And I'll save you the five minutes I spent struggling with that and gave up and we're just gonna take it apart where the last guy did. So we'll pull the hose clamp off of here. We'll leave it attached to the vapor canister. Just pull the hose off. We would have had to do this anyway. I was just gonna do it all on the bench. So now we'll put the new vent solenoid together. We do need the hose that runs between them. There was a service bulletin at one time that wanted you to run like a four foot hose up to the top of the transmission to keep the dirt out of it. And I've replaced so many of these after that service bulletin that it's just as useless. I guess they're just trying to pretend like their solenoids aren't complete junk by blaming it on dirt. So we'll assemble everything back together, put our hose clamps on there. And we'll slide it back up here. Slide it back on our metal tab, clip it in there. We'll put our hose back in. Go find a hose clamp we just dropped. Plug in our solenoid. And we'll torque down our hose clamps. Click. Everything's nice and tight. Should have no leaks. We'll command it on and off a couple times. Make sure it clicks. If it does, we're all good. 
and we'll clear all the codes out. Just so we don't have to look at that pesky check-in and like, should buy us six months till the solenoid goes bad again. And since we're on the topic of common repairs for GM trucks, we'll pop off our little oil cooler line block off cap that always leaks. This is where it's nice having a two wheel drive. This is a little more difficult when it's four wheel drive and you have a differential in your way. Magic Cleaning Fairy came along and cleaned it all up for us because you knew I wasn't going to. So now we have our new gasket, put our cap back on, which is also clean. The Cleaning Fairy was busy. We'll buzz our little block off plate on there. And we have one less oil leak. While we're here, we'll spin the oil filter off, give it an oil change. Oil plug out. Came out without a breaker bar. Guess it wasn't done at Jiffy Lube the last time. Conveniently hang our drain plug on the exhaust. I assume that's why they put the magnet in it. I can't wait for the experts in the comments to tell me the real purpose of the magnet. Like I don't know it's there to calibrate the compass. Screw a drain plug in there. And we'll go at the one inch impact and make sure that it doesn't come back out. Ever. Throw our oil back in. Most of it. Some of it will just get all over the manifold. Get that nice smoky smell. Now we're gonna pull off the wheels. So we can put on our new tires and check some of the suspension and steering, make sure it's all good. Buzz a little cap off and then pull all of our lug nuts out. And we got a loose wheel. Looks like an outer tie rod end. We'll pull our little cotter pin out. We'll spin the nut off with our fingers. Nah, nice and tight. Somebody's been here before. Before we get too far ahead of ourselves, we're gonna loosen up this jam nut. And then we'll continue to spin the nut off the tie rod end by hand. I'll we'll spin our tie rod end off. We'll count our turns. Doesn't really matter, it's going for an alignment. And that goes in the pile. Put some never sees on there. Be nice to the alignment guy. Spin our tie rod on. And drop it in our knuckle. Tighten up the nut. We'll actually use a tool to tighten it and not just our fingers like the last guy. Get the hole lined up in our castle nut so we can put our cotter pin in there. Bend our cotter pin over. All the experts will tell me that's not the right way to do it. But if it keeps the nut from coming back off, I guess it was the right way to do it. I've seen people use a nail and actually didn't even bother me. It was effective. So, and tighten up our jam nut. We'll put our little zerk fitting in the top. And we're gonna do this thing called greasing the car. We'll use those little fittings to put grease in all of the joints so that our parts don't wear out. Once upon a time, the vehicle could have a dozen or more of these fittings and they all got greased. Now most vehicles only have a few, and there's like no chance of any oil change place ever greasing them. To include the dealers. Especially the dealers. So we'll pull the rest of our tires off. Check all of our brakes while we got to the part. 
Make sure we have no more suspension stuff that's worn out. And we'll pull the drum off without a hammer. Wow, must be nice to work on cars in Texas. Uh-oh, this drum is stuck. I refuse to get the hammer. That's for Illinois cars. So our new tires are all mounted up. Our brakes are all done. I actually didn't need anything. A little adjustment on the rear. There wasn't even any rust on the rotors. So, we'll throw them all back together. Tighten the wheels down. And we'll tighten the little cap by hand. If you use an impact on the little plastic caps, they melt. It works once, and then it doesn't work again. So, to keep this cap reusable, I'll just tighten it by hand. Put the wheel in the back. And one last one. I did grease the upper ball joint while it was apart. It was a lot easier to do with the wheel on. And that's it. There's only the two ball joints and the tie rod end that have grease fittings on these. Sometimes the drive shafts do if somebody's changed the U-joints, but these U-joints were actually original. Didn't have any grease fittings. I did check. I'm going to put our license plate bracket on. A couple screws in the top. And there's some rivets that go in the bottom. And since the compressor was running anyway, We'll use the pneumatic rivet gun, or what's known as the assault rivet gun. Now, somebody's been here before, and they just must have thrown this door on all willy-nilly, because it does not line up at all. It's almost touching the rocker on the bottom here. Our body lines don't line up at all. It's too low in the back, too high in the front. They just bolt it in right where it went. I was going to leave it, ah, but it bothered me. We need to give it a little twist. And the real reason is, I need to put the moldings back on, and I couldn't decide if I line up the moldings or if I line up where the moldings should be. So since I was presented with that dilemma, I decided I would just straighten the door out and then line up the moldings with where they should be and everything will be right. So we'll move the striker first. We'll get our back gap all lined up. Now these doors are a little different. This one was replaced with a GM door. So the hinges are not welded on, they're bolted on. It's actually kind of nice. Gives us a little movement. Of course, if they were welded on, maybe the last guy would have got the door in the right place, because he wouldn't have had a choice. But if something was off, it's a little harder to adjust. So we just loosened them up. Now we'll loosen them up a little further so that the door can move. Now that it's latched in the back, it'll hold the back where we want it to go. We'll just move the front down a little bit. And move the back up, move the front down, and hopefully everything will line up. Because if it takes any more than that, it ain't going to be straight. Door a little tug. Doesn't move quite as easy as I had anticipated, but it did move. Check our gaps. And our gaps are looking good now. So now we can snug up the door and put our moldings on. That's as good as it's going to get. 
a little room on the bottom. The door's not touching anymore. So now we can put our moldings on. Pull the backing off the two-sided tape and toss it on the ground. That's legal here, there's, there's no seals, so that's fine. But pretty soon we'll be using paper backings to save the seals in the parking lot. Our other molding on the back. We'll pull off our tape that told me where the molding goes. And then we'll pull off our factory alignment system. Oh, look at that, all the paint stayed on the truck. Bonus. Put the molding on the driver's side. This molding came with our used door. Pull off its label, and we got a brand new molding for the rear door. I think it actually costs as much as my front door, but I don't feel like making a trip to the junkyard to go find one. So I got to install a new part for a change. Line it up, stick it on. and pull off our factory alignment system. I'm going to put our bed rail cover on. Uh, this is the danger of me not doing my job. The painting gnome was in a hurry and I had not taken the bedside apart so he was going to take this piece off and uh, this is a brand new $200 molding because uh, yeah he broke all the clips. So I learned my lesson. Keep ahead of the gnomes. Now we're going to put our armrest in our door panel. Since our other one was completely broken, there wasn't even enough to repair, we had to buy a new one. Pull our switch cover out of there. And then we'll pull our armrest out. And the rest of our armrest. In the pile. And that's why we're replacing it. I don't know what they were doing to it, but that's one of the worst I had seen. Slide it in, start our bolts, and tighten them up. All right, switch bezel back in there, clips into our armrest in the back, and then it has one screw in the front. Much better. Ready to go back in. Now we got this interesting cap for our AC system. I assume that if it's loose you just tighten it up a little bit more. I like how they put some Teflon tape on there just to make sure it didn't leak. If you're going to do it wrong, at least do it the wrongest way possible. If you're going to do something wrong, you might as well put a lot of effort into doing it wrong. And then there's an O-ring on here for... I'm not sure what reason. Because I don't trust this, we're going to change this little piece. We'll take that little fitting apart there, unbolt it from the evaporator core, and just change that little S. Super easy. And Scott's GM Truck Emporium happens to have one in stock. Not sure exactly what they were doing. So now that we have AC once again, our truck is complete. It's all cleaned up, ready to go, ready to take on the salt here in Illinois and it can start its rusting. 
I didn't fix the dent in the tailgate because it's a pickup truck and it's a tailgate. If it gets used, it's probably going to get dented. And if the buyer wants it fixed, we'll add some money to it and I'll fix it. It's not really a big deal. I can always pull the tailgate off, fix it, and then put it back on. So it's not like it adds any time to do that repair later. Unlike fixing some of the other dents, where I had to take doors apart that were already apart. Stuff like that. Our check the light's been off. It's run all its monitors. Everything else seems to work. Not bad for a 15-year-old truck. Going on 16 now. I did get a bonus of a brand new water pump when I bought it, so that's one thing I didn't have to put in. Our headliner staying up there. Interior is nice and clean. Well, except for the bottoms of the windows that no one can see. Those are filthy. And I know you're worried, but I did have the detailing gnome clean that console before I put the seats in. So it looks like this build is done, but there's only one way to be absolutely sure. So it's time to play everyone's favorite game, what's in my console. We all know what comes first. The extra bolts. No job's complete without them. Neither is the side of the road, apparently. What else? Got our haters tears. Hmm, how am I going to fill this up? Oh yeah, that's right. All those people that said I could not sell a two-wheel drive vehicle up here where it snows, uh, yeah, I sold it. So, um, sorry guys. Turns out, I know my market better than you. That ought to fill it up. What else? Looks like I found a solution. Or my bald head that all the little 12 year olds on YouTube like to comment about. Problem solved. What else is in here? Vinyl flooring? Nice stuff. There must be at least 10 boxes in there. Hmm, I'll have to find a use for that. I don't see anything else. I don't think anything else will fit in there. So until I find a use for my vinyl flooring, thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon. Maybe to install some vinyl flooring. Upgrade our carpeted wheel liners to vinyl. Much easier to clean.